Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this seminar. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Peter Howard. Professor Howard is the director of the Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry at the Australian Catholic University. Professor um, Howard is a historian of the Renaissance and of the medieval thought. Uh, his uh, areas of uh, expertise are uh, Renaissance, uh, Italian Renaissance, uh, Renaissance preaching, religion in Florence in the 15th century, Italian Renaissance uh, history. And uh, today, Professor Howard is uh, uh, giving a presentation whose title is Flourishing and Humanists in Renaissance Florence. Uh, dear Peter, uh, thank you very much for your uh, availability, for your generosity, and for accepting our invitation. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I can't see you all because I'm looking at my own screen. So hopefully I'll be able to sort of see you when I'm um, during the question time. The other thing I should say when I said um, yes to Stefano's very kind invitation, I plan to be in Melbourne and um, the timing of the seminar was for that. But now I'm actually stranded in Scotland um, my flights back to Australia were cancelled for various reasons, and I won't be there for another three or four weeks, which is better for me because I'm roughly in the same time zone as you all. The other thing is um, I neglected to ask Stefano really uh, the background of all of you who are sitting in the seminar. So as usual with uh, speaking, you need to understand where your audience is coming from, what they, their background is, what their thinking is, and all of that. So I've decided to do quite a, I hope not too um, um, tricky uh, a presentation. I decided I would try to mix explanation as well as some of my research, um, but also to give a context. And I'm hoping that um, we can develop any thoughts that strike you afterwards. I should also say that my um, one of my weaknesses is that I'm a footnoter, not a headliner. I tend to give far too much detail. So you'll be seeing PowerPoint slides, and some of them will have far too much detail in them. Uh, so please ignore that um, and listen to my words. But I think I'm, and I'm hoping that having PowerPoint slides will help you appreciate um, what I'm saying. And again, I could say lots of things. So my decision has been more about what not to say than what to say. Um, so we'll see where we go during the discussion time. So one of the um, issues that uh, strikes me is that I'm speaking to a group that deals with contemporary humanism. And it occurred to me that you may be coming to this seminar with all sorts of expectation about what humanists may be and what humanism might be. And I'm not sure um, what sort of understanding you're bringing to this seminar. Now, I had hoped that if I could see you, I might be able to ask questions uh, as a way of beginning and have you interact with me. But I suspect that's far too difficult when one's doing this sort of thing uh, remotely. So there are all sorts of um, ways of thinking about humanists and humanism available. And I'm just listing a few of them. And if I, I could see you, I'd ask you to raise your hands as to which sort that you would um, be, be voting for from your perspective and from your own and your own studies. Um, but there is all sorts of um, ways of thinking about it, kindness and civility, philosophical outlooks, um, that are opposed to any sort of religion, an emphasis on um, the humanities, Greek and Latin classics, a very much 19th century German approach, or a literary understanding. There's a whole range of ways in which this could be thought about. 
Um, so um, the way in which I'm approaching it may become clear towards the end, um, because what I will be basically focusing on is uh, a phenomenon that characterizes um, Italy, and I may be telling you things you already know because you are Italian and I'm an outsider from Australia, another part of the world, and perhaps I'm being presumptuous in uh, presuming that you don't um, aren't across this, but um, I'm just going to just go on and you can correct me during during question time. So, um, so I'll be basically working with most likely um, mixed uh, number D on your screen, um, a literary culture, but it flows over to being more than that. And we'll have elements of pretty much all of those elements which you see on your screen. If you want an overview of where I'm going with today's seminar, I'm focusing on Florence, I'm focusing on humanism. Um, in English, we're always scared of isms, be it Marxism or liberalism or any other ism. But the technical term in the period that we're, I'm looking at, 15th century Italy, Florence is a studio humanitatis, and there's a misspelling in the word there. I have an A that crept in, I that crept in, but more that. Um, and basically, I'll be talking about a culture driven by texts, and uh, the text will be newly rediscovered classical texts. And I will be arguing that these texts had immediate relevance, and the text opened a door to a past and allowed the circulation of new ideas which had immediate effect in the society. And I also want to talk about Florence in this period as a, a city, and I can speak more broadly about other parts of Italy as well in the period, where in the foreground is the spoken and the written word. Ancient manuscripts were being sought after, discovered, bought, copied, being read, interpreted, translated. Um, treatises and books were being created in the vernacular, the local Tuscan dialect. Uh, the readership was broad, even way down to the artisan class, artisans, uh, silk workers, uh, cobblers, uh, people who worked um, in all sorts of trades were reading and copying books. And one thing to remember as I begin this seminar is that the, um, the, 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 the rate of um, the capacity to read um, was very high. So literary rates, literacy rates in Florence in this period, um, in various estimations, were around 80%. So, um, so written texts could actually uh, reach quite deeply into society. And also, this is the period where not only is there a huge amount of book copying, and indeed Florence is the center of a huge manuscript trade, which reaches across Europe right into uh, England. But also very quickly, um, Florence follows Venice um, in the middle of the 15th century as um, the uh, advent of printing gets underway, the printing press. So my underlying argument as I go through this seminar with you is that humanism, or the Studio Humanitatis, introduced fundamental changes to the ways people viewed the world and interacted with one another. And there I'm simply um, quoting um, Brian Maxson in his new book, or recent book, on the humanist world of Renaissance Florence, where he starts to trace the social interaction of humanists and um, introducing into the scholarship um, many people who thought in a humanist way um, that have people who have been neglected in, um, in, in, in previous studies, but also the way in which their networks worked. And as I've said, as you'll see at the bottom of the screen, humanism in the historical context um, I'm presenting it, does not necessarily correspond to assumptions which people today often have. The context is Florence. Um, most of you will have been to Florence, I'm sure. But Florence in the period I'm looking at is a quite tumultuous city. And one of the phrases about it, to give some sort of context, is one of the favorite ones quoted by one of my mentors, uh, Jean Brucker. Florence exceeds its masterpieces. 
Genius and civic ferocity were intimately meshed. Out of catastrophes sprang energies that have, in essence, come close to defining Western civilization. Now, that is an overstatement and a very Eurocentric approach to things, particularly as I sit um, here, well, normally in the Southern Hemisphere in the midst of Asia, and my wife is uh, an expert on Asian history, and she would take exception to that, to that statement because there are other flourishing um, civilizations in the period as well. But the impact of Florence and people like Michelangelo, Bocelli, Boccaccio, um, uh, um, Masaccio and a whole, uh, Fra Angelico, a whole range of artists, um, certainly um, lead us into a city of masterpieces. Um, and this whole idea of ingenium, of genius, is very strong in the literature. But also it's a very tumultuous city, a, um, a very um, politically uh, difficult city, and often a very violent city. But again, there is a huge amount of energy underpinning the more bland approach that I, I suspect will come through as the seminar proceeds. So keep ferocity in your mind. There's also a strong sense of difference in the period. The Florence singled itself as being um, different, a different sense of itself. And again, this was driven by the way it um, was drawing in its sense of history and how that was being fed by the classical past. So here I have a small extract from a long oration given by the Archbishop of the city, um, who was Archbishop across um, the period when culturally Florence was very much alive, Archbishop Antoninus, um, and this takes me back to my earliest research on Renaissance Florence. And again, they talk about the nature of Florence itself, shrewd in business certainly, but also expert in arts, expert in law, expert in philosophy, um, expert in religion. Um, so, uh, so a sense of um, what the city is and what it means for the world. I could have chosen other, other texts, uh, Timoteo Maffei, for instance, who lives in Florence for a part of his career, talks about why people want to come to Florence, why people risk plague and even crossing the Alps to visit um, um, the splendor of what Florence is becoming in the 15th century. The other thing which is emerging in this period, and again, it's linked to this whole idea of the vision that comes with uh, the humanism I'll be talking about, there's a new way of seeing. So for instance, at the big, uh, in the 1420s, early on in the period that I'm covering today, um, Goro Dati, a silk merchant, looks around and he sees with new eyes, as the economic historian Richard Goldthwaite has pointed out. He's able to see um, the virtue of the city and how magnificent the city is. And he covers all the major civic monuments from the center of political power, the Palazzo dei Priori, um, to its loggia where the, um, the priors gather in public in front of the main piazza of Florence, um, the merchant uh, guild hall or San Michele, the newly rebuilt cathedral, and also, um, the impetus towards hospital building in the period using the foremost architects um, and also the wonderful um, buildings, palaces being built by the leading families of the city. So a new aesthetic, a new way of seeing. Um, I'll skip that one. There's also a new way of spending money. And here we find cultural context intersecting, mercantile context, economic imperatives, a religious culture, moving through from the period of particularly Thomas Aquinas and the coming of the friars in the 14th century and the building of the great um, churches by the uh, Dominicans, Franciscans, the Servites, um, the Carmelites and so on. And also the growth of lay confraternities and lay participation in religion. And also it's a politically uh, participative culture. But in the period I'm looking at, uh, Florence is moving from a republic, a broad-based guild republic, more and more towards being an oligarchy. So by the end of the 15th century, 
Florence is essentially um, under a de facto prince, um, Lorenzo the Magnificent, Lorenzo de' Medici, and soon after his death, all sorts of other um, political forces um, around the time of uh, the preacher, Dominican preacher Savonarola, uh, re-establish a broad-based um, republic before the events of the 16th century, which I won't go into now. There's also, and this is really important, an increasing sense of historical identity inspired by a new appreciation and new scientific, I've got in inverted commas there, understanding of the classical past. That history is the subject of the day and history, as I'll be indicating towards the end, has a very special role in Florentine self-understanding and in the way in which Florence moves forward. And I also want to mention a new politics, which I've already suggested. This is a period when the, uh, the Medici are on the rise in the, uh, in the city and use all sorts of strategies to consolidate power. So all of this by way of, um, of context. Um, and as I say, um, there's a whole range of new ways of looking at the fundamental changes that all aspects of life were undergoing in this period. For historians, there's a whole range of underlying issues which keep um, um, historians um, in business and still teaching. New approaches to education, new approaches to religion, politics, social and political life, material culture, developments in art and architecture, which most people around the globe, even um, marketers as they do their advertising, are aware of the power of the Renaissance image. Changes in intellectual life, and in particular, the role of language. So what really interests me is the relationship of humanism as a cultural phenomenon to flourishing in the Renaissance, to what made the city, as it were, a Renaissance city, the idea of cultural rebirth. And the other point, which is really important in the work I do and in the book I'm writing at the moment uh, called Theologies of the Piazza, is the way in which it affected all levels of society. One of the problems in thinking about Florence and uh, the whole role of the Studia Humanitatis in Florence is the issue of framing and paradigms. That is the perspectives which the historian brings to um, the materials in the archives and to the manuscripts and the materials on which history is built. And that is not a new thing. Florence itself was developing its own rhetoric. I quoted Archbishop Antoninus earlier, but if I go back to even to um, the figure who the 15th century lauded as being the beginning of its particular culture, um, Petrarch, quid est enum aliud omnis historia quam Romana laus, what is history but the, uh, the praise of Rome? So this sense of um, what, Florence is and why it has become what it is um, becomes one of its major intellectual preoccupations. If we look in the 15th century at the many histories being written, for instance, by the Chancellor of the city, Leonardo Bruni, we find that they do take up that idea of um, um, Romanness. They imitate classical historians. They start to see a sophisticated difference between the antique past and their own present. They have a critical attitude towards evidence. They have a sense of individual character and motive. They even understand causation. And they start to understand the role of history is to teach by example. So they focus on the rhetorical aspects of, 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 of city life. Um, and again, this self-praise, this rhetoric becomes a problem of later historians. And I put before you again the quotation I gave you earlier um, when they talk about Florence as the single summit of eloquence. So Florence's own rhetoric, in a sense, captures it as um, a centre of flourishing. And that's taken up later by, for instance, Giorgio Vasari in his um, Lies of the Artists. Um, and uh, Florentine artists in particular become paradigms of um, achievement.
And because our access to this culture, this historical culture, is by way of these texts, it's very hard not to be actually um, swayed or take on board the bias of the text in favour of the city. In terms of paradigms, again, um, I, I can quote one of the great historians who has been influential for 200 years, Jakob Burkhardt, to each eye, perhaps the outlines of a given civilization presents a different picture. And that's again, true of most histories and we're seeing it played out in our own day um, in Russia. Um, the way in which Florence was understood uh, again through its own eyes um, was built picked up by Jules Michelet. Uh, but Jacques Le Goff, um, the great French historian in the 1960s, um, reminds us that we need to read all historians, and I use this as a warning as you listen to me, um, we need to um, think of people as being of their own time, seeing with their own eyes from their own period. So with Burkhardt, um, a seething 19th century. Um, and in the 1960s for Le Goff, the convulsions of, um, of, of that period. When I was thinking about presenting this seminar, I was aware of crisis. Um, sitting here in the United Kingdom, as I'm sure it's true for you in, in, in Italy, um, Ukraine seems very close. Um, it's only about uh, just under three hours from where I'm living at the moment in the highlands of Scotland. And the, the thought of crisis came to me very, very strongly. And um, I thought I would begin by mentioning one of the paradigms that has shaped um, this period of history. And indeed, one of the great books on Florence and humanism is the book by Hans Barron, The Crisis of the Early Italian Renaissance. Now, this is a controversial book and um, it comes from a whole generation of uh, emigre scholars um, whom I've listed on the screen there, um, who fled Germany for England and, um, and for the United States of America. And it's become very clear that um, crisis drives the historiography. Leonardo Bruni, um, when he writes his history back in the 15th century, um, is very clear of um, the differences between Florence and Milan in terms of their government, Republican versus despotic. Burkhardt, who I mentioned in a previous slide, was undergoing a crisis in his own life of Christianity. Um, and that fed the way in which he wrote about uh, religion in his book of the civilization in Renaissance Italy. But the rise of Nazism had a huge impact on the way in which um, the Italian Renaissance and the Florentine Renaissance in particular was conceived by a whole generation. And that uh, way of thinking about um, Florence um, came through in a whole a range of um, the next generation of historians. And as I'm indicating on my screen, when you get down to the bottom line, DV and FW Kent, Ros Pesman and Lorenzo Polizzotto became the teachers of my generation in the late part of the 20th century. And they had been taught by that group of emigre um, Nazi fleeing um, um, scholars um, who set up particular paradigms of, of, of looking at the Renaissance. Now as with Hans Barron, and now I become, come closer to the topic of today, um, developed this idea of civic humanism, born of crisis and external threats. So Barron argued that it was the threat of Milan invading Florence, and it indeed was moving down into Florence under its, um, its despot, Visconti, um, in the period 1400 and 1402. He saw this as a huge catalyst for Florentine patronism and what he calls civic humanism. And he argued that they were fighting for freedom of speech access to political office, equality of citizens before the law, self-government, what Barron saw as being the fundamentals of modern democracy. And as I thought about this seminar, these are the, the words which are on my mind as we think about 
what Russia is doing in the Ukraine, what Putin is doing to the Ukraine and threatens to do to Europe and the world more broadly. So in a certain sense, um, the sort of work one does and the thinking one does, catalyzed by one's historical work, does help one think in the presence, present. Now, of course, Barron's view has been subject to critique and is conscious and is be reevaluated and is currently being reevaluated um, because it has huge uh, um, 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 amount of benefit in the various perspectives um, it carries. Um, but perhaps it has more pertinence even today. The way in which Barron thought about um, texts and civic humanism flowed over into the way in which art historians even thought about material culture in Florence. So I'm quoting, looking at Frederick Hart's interpretation here of the Guild Church, the Merchant Church of Orsan Michele, and the, um, the statues which were put into the niches of um, the church in the first um, decade of the, of the 15th century. Um, and here we have writ large um, um, great figures um, who are preserving virtu in the face of threats to, uh, to libertas. Um, um, so, um, so, and many of them, like the one you can see on the left of this, uh, in the, in, in, uh, above the figures on the screen, I don't know if I can point that out, but I can't, yes I can, there, um, even in the guise of a, of, of a classical warrior. So this whole relationship between humanism, however one wants to frame it, or whatever paradigm one follows, and the flourishing of what we know in material culture and associate with, 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 with uh, Florence and Italy more broadly, and I do work, work more broadly than just Italy, uh, than Florence, I hate, hasten to add, um, has preoccupied me for most of my um, academic and scholarly life. Um, creating magnificence in Renaissance Florence, I tried to resituate um, a whole argument about why did um, art and architecture take off in Florence in the 15th century, working against some of the received versions, which attributed only to a very narrowly defined classical humanism. I've also tried to think about um, Renaissance religions um, and ran a couple of conferences over two years with Villari Tati in Florence, uh, Harvard Center there, and also in Bologna at the Istituto delle Scienze Religiose with my old friend, um, Riccardo Sacenti, whom Steph and I mentioned at the very beginning um, in our preamble to, to, to this seminar, have tried to think about um, how religion functions um, in the midst of cultural change and intellectual change, including humanism and, and a whole range of different modes of, a, of approaching religion in historical contexts. And just to take one other example, to look at the whole advent of luxury and the role of, of, of language, particularly preaching language, my contribution to a book on luxury and the ethics of greed in early modern Italy. So this whole question of, of the cultural efflorescence of Florence and Northern Italian cities, um, how that works in, in the relationship to the received culture of medieval Christianity, um, and really trying to overturn the way in which we, th we think about language in the period. One of the um, uh, writers who has helped me a great deal is Stephen um, Greenblatt. Many of you may know him from his book, Renaissance Self-Fashioning. But his understanding of culture as a symbolic economy made up of signs um, that excite human desire, fear and aggression have really helped me. And it's really about the capacity of societies to construct stories, use imagery, and um, have sensitivity to language um, that is most important in the way I've come to think about um, language in the public space, face, uh, sorry, in the public places, the public sphere of Renaissance Florence. And that language um, bleeds over from language as words to language as space and material culture. So um, in the period, in a language, in, in a period where 
uh, people are very good at using language to persuade, um, the elements of the culture are highly um, powerful and highly pointed. So by the 15th century, um, the Studio Humanitatis is now a fully fledged um, movement in Florence. Um, there are great teachers, uh, Guarino da Verona, Vittorino da Feltra, and people are thinking about education and erudition as being fundamental to societies. Um, so for example, in one text, we call those studies liberal, which are worthy of a free man. Those studies by which we attain and practice virtue and wisdom, that education calls forth, trains and develops those highest gifts of body and mind, which are noble men, and which are rightly judged to rank next in dignity to virtue alone. For to a vulgar temper, gain and pleasure are sole aims of existence, to a lofty nature, moral worth and fame. So I could take a whole range of, uh, of authors from the period as I have there, who give counsel about how good citizens and the common good are, are generated by um, particular types of, of study. And um, so I, Poggio Bracciolini, the great book hunter, for example, talks about how nobility is best gained and the importance of being civilized within cities and so on. And Leon, Leon Battista Alberti, the quintessential Renaissance person, what a man wants to do, they say, that he can do in a new sense of man, but divinize with new freedom and power on earth, the measure of all things. And what this sense is that the movement, okay, is new, this humanist movement, but it is also humanist in um, a religious sense. It's a new freedom and power on earth. Now, this idea of education and humanism going together, um, and also in terms of paradigms of thinking about humanism, comes forth very strongly in the works of Paul Oscar Christella. He has a fairly narrow sense of, of humanism, and by that he means scholarly, literary, and intellectual activity that centers around the Studia Humanitatis. And what do they mean by that? Uh, technically, that is the study of classical languages and literature and the fields labeled grammar, rhetoric, poetry, history, and moral philosophy. And that um, uh, set of studies, um, Christella gained from reading the sorts of um, catalogues that were being put together by the first pub for the first public library uh, in Europe, which was at, the, at San Marco in Florence. Um, so again, it gives a bit of a sense of what people were looking at. But all of these studies had a purpose. So Hannah Gray sees, sees it as the pursuit of eloquence and a new existential stance in the world, very different from merely slavishly copying words. Language is seen as something with power. And that's certainly taken up by um, theologians in the period when they think about the theory behind preaching. Language is more than words. Language is power. And indeed, if we go back to the middle of the 13th century and one of the earlier humanists, called proto-humanists by some, um, 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 he, he talks about Cicero as being the guide to, to politics. So in a certain sense, if we think about the Renaissance or, or, or something which holds um, the culture of a place like Florence together, it is humanism and the way it bleeds out of education into language and then into material culture that helps give us a, a sense of the period and its unity. Um, I won't waste time on this slide because it just makes a point I've made earlier, a sense of our greater power on earth. The other thing we need to think about when we think about this flourishing, it wasn't um, univocal. There was not only one way of thinking about um, scholarship. There were many types of ways of thinking about the classical past and using the classical past. People focused on texts, they focused on different texts, and they were interested in texts because they promoted civic uh, values, they helped reconstruct cosmology, they helped shift man's sense of his place in the world. 
And this is something which has been made a lot of by Brian Markson and in more recent uh, historiography around humanism in Florence in the period. The other th key thing to note that while I've talked about education, the education was often informal. Um, the university in Florence had a very mixed history in the 15th century. Um, the sort of education we're looking at was often very much self-taught and informal. People gathered in small communities to talk, almost um, like book clubs. Um, Vespasiano da Bastici's bookshop, for instance, Vespasiano was the, the great uh, ran an industry copying manuscripts, and his bookshop was just be behind the center of political power, the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. People would gather there to talk about their ideas, and they would swap books, exchange books. Um, we're associated with, with each of the uh, religious orders in the cities, the France in the city, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and so on. In their studio, people gathered to talk about ideas and the books they were reading. Um, so, and people came from all over Europe um, to to study with um, the Augustinian um, Friar Luigi Marsili, for example, at Santo Spirito, and introduce people to Cicero, Virgil, Seneca, and the old writers, but with new purpose. Now, the interesting thing is um, how people did view these ancient texts. Uh, Leonardo Bruni and Boggio Bracciolini were ancients who were really interested in reconstituting ancient culture in their own time, reconstituting civic values. Others like um, Salutati and Lorenzo Valla in the middle of the 15th century, Lorenzo Valla was the great philologist, they wanted to make use of classical culture for the present and to develop culture for their own age beyond antiquity. They saw uh, classical culture as a heuristic device, we would say today, as a way of interpreting culture. And what was really important, as I've a point I've made before, all of them thought about the role of history and thinking about history. And through this period, quite a number of um, books were written about the history of Florence as they keep, kept trying to broaden how they thought about Florence's identity as um, the um, inheritor of, of, of Rome. Language was important in this period. Um, Latin literacy was very broad, even amongst artisans and ordinary folk by way of preaching. Um, and I've done a, a, a study of um, artisan preaching uh, and artisan literacy at the end for the end of the 15th century, if anyone's interested in that. Um, but not only Latin, but there was a growing interest in Greek across the period. And Greek started to be taught at the University of Florence from the late um, uh, 14th century. And indeed that became, uh, Greek scholarship became very important um, in Florence during the 15th century. And um, Florence was a the place where many of the Greek um, texts um, were, re, were, were retranslated. So Leonardo Bruni, for example, retranslated Aristotle, uh, which had a huge impact on how theology was being thought about, for example. Um, the Council of Florence was very, it was a, a council of the church to bring about the unity of the Eastern and Western churches um, in the middle of the 15th century, again, brought the Greek corp to Florence. And as we move into the middle of the 15th century, um, one of the Medici, Cosimo de' Medici, the pater patrie, father of the fatherland, uh, for his consolation had Marsilio Ficino um, translate um, Greek works into accessible uh, Latin. And they often had disputations, um, again, those informal coteries, those informal groups, um, um, meeting in homes outside the city to talk about issues raised by texts. So all of this to say there was um, new access to books and to texts. And um, the ownership of texts became a sign of wealth. So Antonio Tommaso Corbellini, who lived in the Old Trano across the river, um, was um, famous, uh, was, was proud of his, the 273 
um, manuscripts in his library, 79 of them were Greek works. Um, Vespasiano da Bastici, I've talked about um, uh, manuscripts and book copying, a huge industry. Um, he provided a lot of the basic um, manuscripts which are still found in the Bodleian Library in Oxford today. So this idea of many humanisms, what I like to call with Brian Stock, textual communities, um, means that humanism was not all the same and was layered and interactive. Um, and that's just the library of San Marco. Some historians have tried to talk about um, different phases of humanism. I don't think it holds very strongly. There's a civic and historical, that is um, the type of humanism that focuses on public life. So for instance, Jean Brucker did a huge amount of research on the uh, consulte pratique, the daily discussions of the governing councils of the city in the first part of the 15th century. And he's able to start to trace the degree to which um, ancient texts are being quoted, um, being quoted in the um, in, in council debates by way of thinking about problems facing the city. So you can start to see that even that is an example of the way in which humanism, that is an interesting classical text, bit, bit deeply into society. Um, Marsilio Ficino is often seen to be, a part, and, and his circle is seen to be different from civic humanists, um, but that's breaking down. And I have a doctoral student who's currently finishing uh, a text on Ficino's circle. And it's very clear that um, um, his humanism is very broad and fluid. So one of the key things, if you're studying humanism in this period, we need to avoid reductionism, not to too quickly label people. And I've got a few of the labels against people like Scala, Landino and De La Fonte, which, which are often, um, people are often reduced to. There's all sorts of debates about whether this humanism constituted a Florentine academy. Um, there are studies by Arthur Field and James Hankins. Um, it depends what you mean by the word academy. Is it informal or is it formalized? But very clearly, um, there was a huge push in the period to think about the nature of man. And uh, any new knowledge which would help understand that was embraced. So for example, Pico della Mirandola um, draws on the Kabbalah, for example. Marsilio Ficino is very keen to get back to um, the earliest theologies and religions, uh, his so-called Prisca Theologia. One of the old um, debates um, about Renaissance Florence was that with the, with, and I'm using the language of the older historiography, the rise of humanism meant that we suddenly had an anti-religious society. What I've been trying to show in most of my work over the decades has been that it's actually a very complex religious society. And even Marsilio Ficino in his theological Platonica, and don't forget Ficino was a cleric, he did preach, but he was very engaged in reconciling different strands of historical thought into um, received Christianity. And his, in his introduction to his Platonic theology, which he dedicates to Lorenzo the Magnificent, he talks about the role of religion and the, uh, and the whole quest for knowing oneself and the role that um, Plato had pay, uh, played in his own journey of conversion, as they called it in the period of deepening faith. And again, uh, in the period, there is a strong understanding between the nature of the developing self the civilized human being and material cultures. So in other words, um, material culture, the magnificence of Florence as I've argued elsewhere, is seen as reflecting the moral virtue of the citizenry. So um, this is the fine line around the question of luxuria, luxury. Is it about self-aggrandizement or is it about something else? Is it about showing forth the, the nature of the essence not that one can safely use that word, but that shows forth the character of the city itself and its identity. 
So with this idea of the nature of man uh, being developed, there are new ways of seeing, as I said at the outset, which invade the plastic arts. And here we see uh, a detail from um, um, one of the doors of uh, the Baptistry of Florence and the expulsion of Adam and Eve and how in the plastic arts, the sculptural arts, um, realism um, um, becomes very strong by the 1420s. And there's very self-consciously um, an attempt to create a real style with new, new, um, um, with, with new techniques. But also, as I say and said at the very beginning, there is a sense of living in a great new age. So Giovanni Rucci, the merchant, when he talks about what he's done with his money, talks about these things have given, given me much joy. They redound to the honor of God and Farmer, the memory of me, fame, memoria, memory. Um, his tomb, the Ritualite tomb in San Paclazio, the um, family chapel, is modelled on um, the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So the holy becomes localised. So the, the classicising bent of Renaissance architecture I won't go into. Death masks start to become, become common in the 15th century. Portraits start to become more common. So there is a strong continuity um, often seen um, by the Florentines themselves in the period, at least as we know them through their texts, between the Roman and the classical past. As I said earlier, um, it's a very literate society. So this way of perceiving reaches way down into the society itself. Also because artisans weren't excluded from the debates. Artisans themselves were the makers of the city. And through their guilds, they were often expert patrons. They often had expert advisors advising them on what um, should constitute the best art for, um, um, for their circumstances. And again, I point to the um, merchant church, the guild church of Orsan Michele, and the competition amongst the different guilds uh, where each had um, a guild associated with their, uh, oh, sorry, uh, a niche, and a statue associated with their own guild. There's often a question raised, why do they go for something new? Um, I won't go into the details, but um, I think in the argument I've been putting forward and put forward elsewhere, um, the classicizing bent is, is actually a flow over of language, but also because of a new appreciation of classical art and trips to Rome and also um, ideas around um, ancient architecture, um, which people like um, um, Brunelleschi, the creator of Florence's cathedral, uh, was exposed to in his career. Again, a point I've already made, the upper classes are involved in patronage of uh, the works of art in the city, as are the artists. Um, architecture leads the way. Um, artists have status in this period. So the Archbishop of Florence will say that um, an artist is to be paid as much as a goldsmith or more. Um, it's a participatory society. The um, artisans are the creator class, as I've said, but it's also a small society. Everyone was talking and able to see what was going on. Now, all of that said, in a lot of the historiography, what is uh, missing is a, a well-articulated understanding of the role of religion and theology. And this brings me back to my um, quotation from Stephen Greenblatt, that the con context of Florence was a world created by words. And the, the key public speakers in the period in the piazzas, and piazzas were created for preachers, um, they were framed by words. And um, here we start to see that preaching is a vehicle for ideas. And I've done a study which shows that as we move through the 15th century, preachers more and more are quoting from classical examples in their sermons, which is a reflection of the increasing classical literacy of the population in general. Because if preaching is about communication, you don't use classical examples, classical exemplar, to no effect. 
The other thing to note is that preachers uh, as and artists also deal with contemporary events. And I've written a study on this image from the Brancacci Chapel in Florence, which talk about uh, the meaning of the gospel scene of the tribute money in the context of uh, papal taxation of clergy in, the, in times of war in Florence when it was under pressure um, uh, in its war with Luca. So here I'm coming back towards the beginning, um, and this is uh, the relationship of not just um, classical understandings of magnificence and Aristotelian understandings of um, magnificence um, a la Ernst Gombrich or A.D. Fraser Jenkins, but also the way in which um, preachers also pick up the same ideas, but also feed it into, feed them into um, classical religious ideas, like the virtue, the cardinal virtue of magnificence. And um, so I've started, oh, well, I do make arguments for the complex interplay of language in cultures around the pulpit and what that means practically. So creating magnificence in Renaissance Florence, um, or in an earlier version, preaching magnificence in Renaissance Florence makes a great deal of the interplay between um, um, the classical language, uh, the language of the Studia Humanitatis, and, 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 and preaching. And I have a forthcoming contribution to a Brill book on Renaissance scholasticism, which actually looks about, talks about uh, the way in which scholasticism and humanism in this period in Florence work together. So again, this is just another example drawing on Archbishop Antoninus who writes on what pertains to the magnificent man that money needs to be spent on public and divine things. Um, chapels, hospitals, and um, things of public utility. Things which, um, and those with money, those with power, are obliged to purify, uh, to beautify the city and to provide for the common good and for the poor. So that is something really that comes through very strongly um, in all the texts. So what is emerging out of the language of, of antiquity and uh, the way in which that is worked in with theology is an aesthetic vocabulary. But at the same time, there's also awareness of the relationship between language and power, but also physical embellishment and power. So again, Cosimo de' Medici is having to be defended in the middle of the 15th century by um, Di Matteo Maffei for um, the churches he builds, um, uh, the monasteries he restores, etc. cetera, um, because people accuse him of trying to behave like a prince. Um, now that's partly true, but, um, but what is interesting is the defense, which makes a huge uh, uh, amount of use of um, of, of theology, but as well as uh, classical examples. And now I'm moving towards the end. And I'm using Timoteo Maffei and his defense of Cosimo. And it really sums up, uh, I think, what um, is going on in the period. Um, truly a knowledge of the history of our forefathers makes us want to imitate the, the strength of those whom we admire and then praise. Or just like faces in a mirror, the habits of men are shaped for better according to an exemplar. So in a certain sense, um, this whole interest of the Studia Humanitatis in the classical past and its texts and its physical remains is about creating the present. How the remembered past becomes a present exemplar for action and thinking in Renaissance Florence. So coming to a conclusion, the idea of humanism and the studio humanitatis in the context of Renaissance Florence is a fundamental notion, but is constantly in need of revision and nuance. Um, okay, the revival of interest in classical antiquity as a driving force needs to be linked with the received world of Christian culture and that world being remade under this in a dynamic with this new influence.
The whole point of the classical past was to inspire virtue, good citizens, la vita civile, um, but also it meant that a firm knowledge of, of the fundamentals of language enabled one to use language well to move others to morally correct points of view. So humanists in the period offered a new focus for study, new approaches to problems, a new style in which to express themselves, fundamental changes to the ways in which people viewed the world and each other with writings on civic life, on friendship, on the family. They reintroduced texts to the West or into Europe that made possible voyages of exploration, a form of religion, scientific revolution. So I guess my final point is uh, about humanities, the Studia Humanitatis, the liberal arts, which are constantly under threat, particularly in my home country of Australia, that innovation in the humanities is fundamental to all academic disciplines. And um, um, civilization in the world is in our hands, as that is in the hands of people who study humanism and do it with precision and a critical view and able to perceive where they're coming from and what sort of paradigms they're using when they create past worlds in order to understand a better world present, our present world better. Thanks very much for your, your attention. And I hopefully haven't gone on too long. Over to you, Stefano, I think.